What's going on there, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube? This will be my video on how to reload ammunition. Uh, the reason that I decided to make this video, I was looking around for um, when I began reloading on YouTube, and the only thing I could find was like these hour-long videos that just went on and on about things that were kind of irrelevant, and they didn't really, they would reload like 50-something rounds. If you're just trying to figure out how to use the press and how to use the dies and all that stuff and what all the terminology is and what it all means, um, I think that can actually be explained a lot quicker, so I'm just going to go right into this and start with uh, discussing why you should reload, what you'll need to reload, and then actually running you through every single individual process. So the first thing to cover is why, why you would reload um, to begin with. I mean, it's so much easier just to go to the store and buy ammunition. So what's the point of reloading? Well, every, act, uh, every rifle is built differently. There's certain tiny little microscopic variances that, that can affect how different ammo will shoot in your rifle. So what you're basically doing when you reload ammunition and you, and you actually tailor that um, the amount of powder that you put in there is you're, you're actually tuning the ammo to your gun for better accuracy. And it's amazing what even one or maybe two grains of a difference can do um, as far as when you're shooting how much more accurate your gun is going to be and it's also a fun hobby that is going to save you money in the long run and I'll kind of break that down right now so the cost savings per round there's a lot of things to take into consideration and keep in mind when we're reloading ammunition I'm assuming with all these uh, these figures on the screen right now that you are using brass that's already been fired this is not for new brass I don't consider brand new brass reloading because it's never been loaded I consider it just loading or making ammunition. This is for reloading um, at least a cartridge that's fired, been fired one time. So, to break this down, um, here in New York, one um, pound of powder is about $30, and that breaks down to about 7,000 grains per pound. Um, my 308 load is 43.7 grains normally when I use like the Sierra Match Kings, um, and that means that I get 160 rounds per one pound of powder, which means it's 19 cents per round. Um, I buy bullets, uh, usually like the little 100 round boxes, and those are $40 off the internet, so that's about 40 cents per round. And then the last thing would be a box of primers that I usually just get at a local store. Um, those are about $5 a box for 100, so that makes their cost only 5 cents per round, uh, bringing the total to 64, uh, 64 cents per round to reload. And as it says, sales tax varies on the actual cost. Um, if you're ordering pretty much everything online, you don't have to worry about sales tax. You just got to figure shipping and stuff in there. Now, if I was to go to the store and buy match-grade factory ammunition, such as the stuff I was using before was the Federal Gold Medal Match, um, and it had the same projectile. It had the Sierra Match King 168 grain um, and all that stuff. It, it was very nice ammo, but again, it, 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 it's expensive. Uh, $30 per 20 rounds means $1.50 per round, and again, with sales tax and such. So, uh, basically what you're looking at is your total cost and when you actually pay off the equipment that you invest in um, purchasing to reload your own, your own rounds. The way that I figured it, because I only spent about $578 on all of my equipment in total, um, and the beginning, um, like powder, primers, projectiles, everything, after about 683 rounds for me personally, uh, the equipment more or less pays itself off because I'm saving 86 cents um, every time I pull the trigger. So eventually that 86, um, 86 cents will add up. If you times 86 cents by 683, it's going to come out to about 587, 570, somewhere around there. Um, and that is the point of doing this, is once you, once you actually reload enough ammunition to where you're saving money and the equipment is paid for itself, then everything beyond that is just you saving money. So next we see here a really brief rundown of all the equipment that I had to buy in order to do this process and in order to actually reload my own ammunition. Um, I'm not going to really break down every single one of these things right now. What I'll actually do is put a link down in the description that will tell you every single thing that I bought and more or less what it came with as a kit, if it was a kit item. And pretty much the only thing that was here that was a kit was just the, the reloading press. So really quickly, basic things you're going to need, you're going to need a reloading kit or at least everything that comes in that kit, which is going to be the press, the powder measure, primers, um, primer holder. Uh, it does come with a scale. I did not care for it. And it comes with a bunch of little tools that we'll get into, like the, uh, the, the case trimmer and all that stuff. Next thing, you're going to need a set of dies. 
Uh, you're going to need, you don't really need, but you can get rock, uh, lock ring eliminators. I know Hornady has their own style. Lee has its own style. And there's other ones that have their own, like RCBS has its own style of lock rings. And that is just so you can lock it down once you get your dies set, so you can save your settings and then just pop the dies in and out of the press. Uh, you would need a, um, a, a quick trim die, which is all the way on the right and the top there. Um, and that is just going to be specific to whatever cartridge you are reloading and you'll be able to set um, with your uh, case resizing tool, you'll be able to actually set it to what, uh, what size you want your cases. You're going to need powder, primers, uh, projectile of your choice. You will need a, a, another scale unless you want to rely on the one that comes with the kit. I like digital because it's faster and the one that I have I actually compared against a $300 RCBS um, one that auto trickles and everything and this one here I just it was fine for like $80 or whatever I paid for it I also have a powder trickler so I can manually trickle in my powder I bought some plastic MTM cases uh, just to hold my finished ammunition you'll need tumbling media a tumbler um, a digital caliper set and also a, uh, a reloading tray which makes it a lot easier to actually reload and all this stuff combined was 587 bucks so uh, not really bad so the image that's on the screen right now is something I actually came up with. I printed this out and hung it behind my press just to have it as a quick reference. This shows you the workflow order you will need to process brass because fire-formed brass and new brass or range brass um, will need to be uh, handled differently. Fire-formed brass is brass that has been fired from your rifle and when the explosion takes place um, in, your, in your rifle's chamber what that's going to do is actually form the brass to your rifle and then the only thing you have to really do is collet size it. If it came from somebody else's rifle and their rifle have, happens to have a bigger chamber than yours, it may be just by a couple thousandths of an inch, there is a possibility that when you go to chamber around that hasn't been full resized that it will not fit in your rifle. So basically, if it's been fired in your gun, you can get away with collet sizing it. If it's been fired out of another gun, it's a good idea to do a full length resize until you actually fire it from your, from your gun. So at some point though, these two processes, the fire formed and the range brass will line up and then you can just mix all your casings together and finish the process as, as a whole. But until that point, you more or less want to keep your brass separated. Um, for the purpose of this video, I did mix up the brass just because I specifically shot federal casings the other day and my friend shot Perfecta. And that way I will know when I tumble them, I don't have to mark them or nothing, I'll know just when I tumble them, that all the Perfecta needs a full length 3 size and all the Federal does not need a full length 3 size. And then of course after the resizing and all that stuff we'll move on and I'll, I'll go through every one of these processes as I do them. I also did put a print up of a, uh, a bullet there. Just Those are all like the, the factory specifications of ammunition like the case overall length. How long the actual uh, brass cartridge needs to be without the bullet in it and that's what you would actually trim to and we'll get into all that stuff so let's get started with that all right so now what we're going to do is we're just going to start tumbling some shells you'd want to open up your tumbler um, i put enough media in there to basically i guess fill this thing about halfway up there's a lot of different opinions out there. This seems to work for me, so if it's not, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And I have just a random assortment of two to three rounds in here, and I've got some larger three weights in the bottom. Again, I can tell all the range brass from my own because all the ones from my buddy's rifle all have that um, that bronze colored or brass colored, I should say, the brass colored. Uh, primers in them, but normally you wouldn't mix them. In this case, I know which ones are which, so I'm not really too worried. All you're going to do is take your brass and dump it on in there, okay? And then this here will be for separating that. We'll get to that later. So, after all your brass is in there, you want to put your lid back on the device, like so. And when you tighten down this wing nut, um, you don't really need to make it insanely tight. What I do is push down slightly like that and then just let it snap up. As long as it's not moving around a whole lot, don't worry about it. Go ahead and hit your power switch and it's going to get loud. 
and in a minute once that stuff starts to break up and all that you'll see it churn in a little bit more there it goes see all the little pieces of brass in there they're all kind of churning around and what's actually happening is when those uh that's actually crushed up walnut and it vibrates around the shells at a very high speed and uh, that vibration actually causes it to clean the brass off and get any crap that's on there gets it all off so um I normally let, let this thing run for about a half hour. I don't really care if my ammo looks pretty. I just care that it works. So I just do this for about a half hour until it gets most of the carbon and stuff off of there. And then uh, I'll come back and show you how to complete this process. So my brass is all tumbled. All the shells look really great. They're all really shiny. You know, they have a nice polish to them. Those will work fine. What we're going to do now is we're going to separate the brass from the media using this colander. Got this at Walmart for, I don't know, like $3. And the, the colander, I, just, I literally took this over to the aisle where these were to see if it would fit in there like that. And it worked perfect. So, um, yeah. Make sure to unplug this thing. And you're just going to dump it in. It's uh, not really rocket science or anything. like that you'll see some of it running through a little bit so give it a quick shake like that and move your lid and then what you can do at this point on my my pink towel um, just start picking your brass out this is a good time. Honestly, I, a lot of people don't like doing all this process where you have to manually empty shit and they get the things where you roll them and it knocks most of the media out. I don't mind doing this by hand because this is a good time for me to inspect my casings to make sure that they're not cracked and that there's no problems, no major malfunctions in the, in the near future. So just pick up your brass, have a quick look. It's, you know... This is supposed to be a hobby. So, whatever you got to do, you try to utilize every process that you do to do something else. So the next step in this process is going to be resizing my, uh, my range brass. These ones here are the Perfectas. These ones on this side are the Federals. These ones don't need a full resize. These ones do. I'm basically going to go through all the processes that we need to do with this first, then I'll move on to this, and then once they can come together in one pile, I'll continue doing that. So the first thing we're going to need is we're going to need our full length resizing die, which is this one right here. A lot of people wonder what this thing on the top is. This little pin will actually push up when it encounters resistance. The way that I set this and pretty much the general consensus on the internet and um, in the manual is you want to just take a wrench, put it on there, another one on here, and just tighten it as, as much as you can by hand. Don't like whip out torque wrenches and shit. You really don't need to put a whole lot of tension on it. You just want it tight enough so when you pull your casing out that it does not, uh, doesn't pull the pin with it. So this little lock ring has a, um, a notch in it that will line up with the notch on the press. You drop this in there and then you just spin it until it clicks into place like that. Okay. Another thing I'm going to need in my little handy drawer here, this is my primer. Um, this puts the primers in there, it's a primer arm, whatever you want to call it. I do that, I, I'm just going to put this in here for this process because without that in there, the primers, when they come out of the casings, will just fall on the floor. If that's in there, it directs them through this little hole and then they fall down into this tube for a disposal. So, I'm going to use my RCBS case lube pad. I didn't mention this in the cost because I got this for free um, from uh, my fiance's father. So, first thing you want to do, and if you don't have this pad, you can do this process by hand. Um, it doesn't really matter. Put a little case lube on there, like that. All right. But you can do this by hand. Try not to get the wax on this hand because this is the one you're going to be grabbing all your equipment with. You want to keep this hand clean. 
this one here I usually start the first round by just using this to spread this crap out and this is just a really thick like waxy material spread it out all over that pad just like that okay so there's definitely way too much on there I can kind of wipe some of the excess off over here and stuff um, but yeah that's got more than enough lube on to you can see I'm kind of putting them with my hands here and then you want to just kind of blot it so you get some in the neck um, so you don't have cases hanging up on your press or anything that would probably not be a very good day um, anyways it's all inside there and everything so we're going to put that in there you don't ever want to lower it too much because then it's going to want to try to prime it so i usually just keep this right where it is and you're going to take that first casing with lube on it and you're going to run it up into your full length resizing die i'm actually i should probably set this up first so to set this die up, you want to back this out a little bit. Bring your, your ram all the way up. And I hope you can see up in there. But I'm just twisting the die down until it just makes contact with the ram. Bring the ram all the way down and turn this quarter turn in like that. I have a wrench around here somewhere. And then I'm just going to give, I'm just going to snug this up until I know it's set right. And that apparently doesn't do it that way. <laughs> well, shit. So, just snug that so it's not moving on you. It doesn't have to be super tight. It's, I mean, so, anyways, back to what I was doing. Take your first casing and you're going to take this up into the full length resizing die you'll feel some resistance and you'll see the primer is going to uh, pop out of there and fall in um, all the, well, like when I bottom it out so there it goes it's all the way inside of the die all right and then you're going to pull it back out it should be somewhat effortless if it's going in there really tight I don't think you're using enough case lube so this one is done it's deep primed okay set that aside grab the next one Roll it through the case lube a little bit or put it on with your hands. Doesn't matter either way. And then get some inside the neck there. All right. We do the next casing. Run that up into the die all the way. The primer pops out. You pull the casing out. And then once you do this a couple times, you can more or less just run through it like that. Okay. Again, all the way up in. Primer pops out good to go and then our last one just like that really really simple all the way up in primer pops out pull it out so these are all resized now to factory spec these ones are all still the fire form rounds that just need the collet sizing so the next thing that we're going to move on to and now that i know that that is set correctly i can go ahead and lock that down like I said, not super tight. And then, uh, shit, I got wax all over my hands, but whatever. I don't think it's on my pinky. Can undo that die. Take that out of there. And now, I'm going to put my collet sizing die in, which is going to be, where the hell is it? This one. <laughs> this one here is my collet sizing die. And you'll notice that also has a depriming tool, which it comes in handy when you're doing your ones that are already formed. So, again, you're going to press this down in there and turn it until it locks in. And take this, you're going to back this out a little bit. Now, the directions say for the collet sizing die, it's pretty much the same thing. You want to back out your die, like have your ram all the way up, okay? Bring your, uh, bring your die in until it basically just makes really light contact with that ram, okay? bring the ram down and you can see I have a line there so I can watch what I'm doing so I'm going to start by going a quarter turn in all right and locking down that die temporarily see not moving now you can take your resized casing and you can start setting basically a collet size is actually sizing this portion of the shell so that it will clamp onto a bullet um, enough to hold it temporarily until you actually crimp the bullet 
which I'll get into that. So what we're doing is we're taking this, the same as the first one, you're taking it all the way up inside of the die, all the way to the bottom. I felt no resistance there, but then again, I might not need to fully collet size these. If I take one of my bullets, it's already pretty tight. And that's just from the full length resizing die. It does make them a little tight. So anyways, that one's been run through. And then you're gonna run this one through like that. Same thing with this one. And then the last one. Okay. Now, these are all, um, these have been tumbled, they've been full length resized, they've been uh, deprimed, and they've been collet sized. So those can literally just sit off to the side for a minute while we start our other processes. All right. So being that we already have the collet sizing die in there, we can move right on to the, uh, the other, the federal cases that just need the collet size. These already have the primer in them, so we will deprime them at the same time that we're collet sizing. So this one here, take it up into the press, it deprimes, and you bring it out. And now we're going to check, just take, a, take any one of your, your projectiles, and you stick it in there. That <laughs> is too loose. So what we can do now is loosen up the press, or the die, I'm sorry. Loosen that back up so this will turn and do another quarter turn. Okay, just like that. Send this one back up in there. It does feel a little bit tighter. And it needs to be, it, it's, it's holding it, but not enough. It's, it's still loose enough where I can pull it in and out. But the next increment that I go will be a lot more small. I'm going to do an eighth turn. The pro like this whole thing is based on just being patient. Like just do it right the first time. Okay, bring that press all the way down and check it one more time. See now it's giving me a little bit more resistance. So that's good. That that's what you want is for it to hold it, but not be impossible to get in there. All right. Keep this out because when you first set a die, it's going to want to adjust and move around. So you're just going to want to check it on a couple more rounds. Primer comes out, and our projectile fits tight. So now you can just kind of move along and start punching these suckers out. Like that. And that last one fit. So that's all there is, is to it to, for that portion of this. So now both of our casings are the same size. The fire form cases only needed to be tumbled and collet sized and deprimed. They are. The uh, range brass needed to be tumbled full length resized and collet sized. So now all of these casings can be put together because the rest of the processes can all just go hand in hand. So it doesn't really matter at this point. You can mix them all together to your heart's content and then we'll move on to the next process um, which is going to be cleaning out the primer pockets. So the next process what we're going to do is be cleaning out the primer pockets just to get some of that carbon and stuff out of there. If you bought the press kit it will come with one of these little uh, primer pocket cleaning tools. All you do is you just stick it in there and give it a couple twists until it looks like all that crap is cleaned out of there. There's another one. I don't think I really need to show this for 10 minutes here. It's, this is pretty straightforward. You just push in the tool into the primer pocket until it's clean. You can see right there some of the crap that's going to fall out and it's going to leave that a lot cleaner. So we can move on to the next process now. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to be trimming the cases. This is my case trim die. All right. This one does not have a lock ring. I used the original one that came with it, but this is a very unspecific <laughs> die. So it, I just put it on there wherever it would stay. Um, you're going to go ahead and drop that into your breech lock, just like that. You're going to take this tool, and you're going to put it up in here. By the way, this has a, a click adjustment right here to change how long or short the cases are. Mine is already set up to trim uh, my cases to factory spec. That's something you'd have to look 
either in your reloading manual or uh, you know like a diagram off the internet whatever to find out what that is um, you don't want to go too far down because you will uh, you'll you'll knock that off you and then right there it's pretty much just bottomed out in the press which is exactly where you want it so take your casings one at a time you're going to insert them in there like that you'll feel a little bit of resistance because there is a nylon washer up in there that makes this fit kind of tight so send it up in you'll see that lift up this is simple you push down and you just spin around a couple times and you'll you'll feel it it doesn't cut anymore and you pull that shell out now what that has done in one single process is is it has shortened the case to the proper length and it's also taken the burr off the outside and the inside this this is it's a chamfer and deburr deburr process set that one aside that case is good to go it's proper length all the other process has been done again moving along push that one up in there you can hear it cutting a little bit when it stops making that sound it's done so that shell the casing whatever is good to go one more of these send it up in there push down and just listen so right about there it start, starts grinding a lot less it gets really smooth that's how you know when it's done so that one there and you can see all that brass that comes out of there that's exactly why I wash my cases but we'll move on to that uh, next all right, so the next step in our reloading process is we're going to be washing our casings. As you can see on this one, it's got a lot of wax stuck on it. It's got a lot of crap inside of it. So we're just trying to get all that stuff out. And not to mention the primer pockets could have some carbon left over. I use this little plastic bin. Throw some hot water in there. That heat and the hot, like the hot water will actually loosen up the wax and any carbon that could be on there. So just drop those in like that and then just swish them around a little bit. And that seems to be loosening up a lot of the crap that's on there. rinse them off pretty much rinse them off with the hottest water you can tolerate I mean that's that's pretty hot and uh, you can feel if there's still wax on them these ones feel like they're all right just rinse them out really good and set them aside again this is optional a lot of people don't like to wash their brass because it's I don't know if it's too much work or what um, but I know I wouldn't want to be putting cases into my rifle that still have uh, case lube on them or any kind of uh, brass filings from when you trim the case or any kind of carbon or anything. So you don't really need to use soap or anything. You just, just hot water is enough to get that case lube to come off. But uh, next we will uh, we'll dry these. All right, so the cases have been dried. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can actually dry casings. Some people uh, prefer to actually just leave them out um, and, and let them dry naturally. Um, a lot of people will use uh, these things that look like a food dehydrator that is meant to do the same thing. It basically just circulates warm air around them and dries them that way. I personally just put them on a baking tray and put them in the oven for on 200 degrees for about 20 minutes and they are bone dry. So <clears throat> these are all dried by now. However you want to dry them is completely up to you. It doesn't really matter as long as it's dry. You do not want any kind of moisture in your powder. Um, so what we're going to do now, uh, the next step is to prime them. And one of the things you want to do if you're going to be priming um, and not using this, this contraption here, which I don't care for it, um, there's two different ways you can do this. Uh, one big concern is, is you don't want to get finger oils on your primers. Um, just because it could cause some problems. That's just what I hear. I've never experienced any problems. I always hand load all my primers one at a time. And I've never had a single issue. So 
but then again before I before I reload or before I specifically do the part with the primers I wash my hands with some Gojo hand cleaner it strips all the oil off your hands and it leaves them very dry and that is the the best time that you can actually prime with your hands so to prime them you're going to use this little um, primer arm thingy that came with your press if you push it all the way forward it'll stick up through like that take one primer and you want the shiny side down and then just put it in there just so it sits right in that little thing bring your press up a little bit take your first casing okay this is when you should be wearing glasses by the way safety glasses so push it down until it makes contact you'll see the shell kind of stand up a little bit more straight all right and then you just want to push it forward and you will feel it click and bottom out just like that then you just want to look at it from the side like look at its profile and make sure that primer is all the way in there and that it's completely um, flat with the case so this one's done i'll set that back there take the next primer and again pop that into a little holder and then just drive it forward like that it'll stop again inspect and then once i get done priming all these we can move on this is a very simple process so i'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it all right so now that our cases they're all primed they're all ready to go um, and they're all ready to have a charge put in them all right before you actually just start throwing powder into them um, you actually have to do a little bit of load development if you have a reloading manual or any kind of a reloading guide um, this will give you kind of a, a starting point as to how much powder to put into your casing so we have 308 winchester this gives you all the specs um, for your ammunition and you, you see they have different things here they have 100 grain jacketed 110 grain jacketed 110 grain barns x solid um, so we're going to go straight back to 168 grain jacketed bullet that is what I, I used when I developed the loads for my um, for my Sierra boat tail hollow point ammo um, according to Sierra or so as I read on the internet uh, they say to basically use the same um, load that you were using for the SMK for the TMK um, in case you're not familiar with the term terminology, this is a TMK bullet. It just means tipped match king, and all that means is that these have a, uh, a ballistic tip on them that causes them to fragment earlier than something like a, uh, a hollow point, which this here is some ammo that I loaded up um, before. And see, so it has a tiny little hollow point in there. But these are actually, these are shorter, but... Um, they apparently Sierra wants you to use the same formula at least as a starting point if you've never loaded ammunition before you basically have to start from scratch so find your bullet size and what this will tell you I'm using the IMR 4064 powder it'll say start grains and it'll also say never exceed and then it'll have this M or M I N O L A. that means minimum overall length that's the shortest you can possibly make the bullet so what you need to do is find the spot in between 4165 and 45.9 um, what i did was i added these two numbers and divided by two to get the average which would be the exact middle of both of those go ahead and put this away and i'm going to get out my reloading notebook and i've already wrote out right there that was the middle of those two numbers was 43.7 so what you want to do is you actually want to start with that load in the middle you want to go two grains low, so 43.5, and then you want to go two grains above, 43.9. And what you're basically doing is you're figuring out, this is the part where you actually figure out which um, charge is going to work best in your specific gun. And you should have a notebook like this where you just keep um, targets and shot data and that kind of thing. This is from my first um, one when I was developing my other loads. These are just different targets. And they saw it on there, the different grains I was using, like obviously, like 43.9, that, that was my group size. This was 44.1, it gets a little bit erratic, 
and then I get up to 44.3 and it just it gets really bad so actually the load that I started with was 43.7 and that was ideal those groups are awesome so for the purpose of this um, specific load I'm gonna start with my like the right in the middle load two grains low two grains high so moving on what we need to do now now these are primed and we can actually put a charge in them we're going to go ahead and put some powder in our, our powder measure um, if you twist this to the left I think let's figure this shit out I don't even know my own equipment um, nope twist it that way it opens that port if you turn it it closes it which makes it really convenient to empty these things so um, take the lid off that I'm gonna go ahead and put that right in the powder dispenser all right grab some powder and you should always put way more powder in than what you actually need um, and the point of this is it allows the powder to have some weight behind it so it it flows more evenly so take your powder dump this into here you don't have to dump it super fast or anything just dump enough in there so that's about halfway up all right and don't leave this stuff sitting around without the cap on it. All it takes is one spark, um, static shock, whatever, and boom. So keep it closed. Plus, you don't want crap getting in there contaminating it. So first thing you're going to do before you actually start um, putting loads inside of the cartridges, get your little funnel out, all right, and set that on your first round. In this case, I'm doing three different loads. So I am going to space these out just to kind of cut out any confusion. And now it kind of starts to make sense why I did nine cases. Load number one, sample size three. Load number two is sample size three. And load number three is sample size three. You don't ever want to just shoot one bullet. That would be stupid. And actually, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't accomplish anything. So I'm going to go lowest, medium, highest load right there. I have my scale all set up. I went through the calibration process. I'm not going to show you how to do that. Because if you don't have this scale, it's kind of pointless. And I'm actually going to get my powder tricker trickler ready see it's got the powder already in there and take the little cap off here and this cap and this thing is actually like solid steel or something it's heavy as hell which I like because it stays planted firmly where you leave it and then I just get that ready to trickle powder this is the scoop out excess powder if I go too much so take your little dish and you're going to want to throw a couple of bullshit charges basically just to settle the powder so there's one there's another one and there's another one all right and then take that right up here and dump it back in and then just do that a couple more times all right and that's probably good enough now what you'll notice is I'm putting this dish right up against that. If you don't, if you hold it like this, when that powder hits this hard surface, it splashes everywhere. And that's annoying as hell. So hold it right up against it. Okay. Throw your charge and then weigh it. Now keep in mind, for my first one, again, if I go back to my reference, I'm going with 43.5, then 7, then 9. So I gotta get this as close as I can to 43.5. So that actually threw it at 43.1. I use my trickler, and you can actually watch, and you can see little grains of powder start to fall right there. See them trickling in? That's why they call it a powder trickler. And then you just pay attention to this. Just do a little bit at a time. See a little more. No. 43.5 giving it a second to stabilize so it's it's hanging out on 43.4 the most so I think one little little tiny bit more right there 43.5 and that circle there means that it's zeroed so or it's mm -hmm. settled very important part about powder this is the dangerous part of reloading and unless you want to squib load you have to pay attention to what you're doing if you're talking to someone, listening to music, watching TV while you're doing this process, you need to knock that stuff off because if you get distracted 
um, it could cost you either your life or it could destroy your rifle. So anyway, you're going to pour this in slow like that, just so it trickles down into that casing. Before you go anywhere from this point, after this is empty, your hand needs to be on that funnel, moving it. And the purpose is so you don't lose track of what you're doing and double charge one round. Okay, so go back up, throw your next charge. Go right over here. So I landed on 42.6. I need to be at 43.5. So trickle in a little bit. A little bit more. Oh, almost there. One more little bit. No, nope, that went up. Not so right there. It's hanging out. In between 43.4 and 43.5. Tiny little granule more. Ought to do it. Give it a second to stop jumping around. So right there is good. So I pick that up. And I pour that one in. I'm not going to sit here and do all this on camera because you get the idea. You throw the charge and then you trickle in the exact amount you need or minus it. And whatever. It's Everything works in conjunction. You just want to make sure you have the exact load you need. Dump it in there. As soon as you're done dumping, move this. Okay, and I'll come back once these are all done to show you other processes. So all of our cartridges have charges in them now. One very important thing you got to do before you start putting bullets in here and everything is you want to actually look down into each individual case and verify that there is a charge in there. You do not want an empty shell um, because you'll get squib loads. So after those are charged, you want to go ahead and put your powder away. It's very important that you do not leave powder in your hopper because there's something that's in the, the, the powder that can eat away at the plastic in this and it can also ruin the powder that's sitting in there. The easiest way that I found to do this is turn the valve off on the hopper like that. Pull it up out of there, make sure there's no powder hanging out. Take your top off and then just throw the rest of the charges into the hopper. See it? coming out I don't think it'll hurt the metal but still you just you just don't want powder that's sitting there being exposed to air and then take this actually I'm gonna put this on here before I get distracted and spill it the thing I like about these Lee ones is you can just hold this over the powder powder canister and then it just drains out so set that on there for a minute, and all that stuff will drain up out of there. While that's doing that, actually, I can put the cap and stuff back on here. Put your finger over the end of this, and just give it a couple taps so it kind of falls back in the tube and doesn't go flying. If you do buy this specific trickler or any trickler that has a cap, make sure you cap this end first, and then put your big cap on second. If you don't, this will create a vacuum when you snap it down and you'll have powder that will go flying everywhere. So it's probably not good to have powder just laying around. And then when you're done with your scale, um, it's a good idea to put the cover back onto it like that and then just unplug it and just store the cord, you know, wherever the hell you're gonna store it. Mine just hangs back there. This just needs to be shaken out a little bit. And just make sure that you do not have pieces of powder which I don't that thing's completely empty I'm gonna go ahead and I'll just leave it open that way when I go to pour powder in again next time I'm gonna go straight into the thing and then cap off this so now we can actually start getting into um, seating our bullets inside of these charge cases so so far in the process we have the uh, the fire formed and range brass has all been mixed together it's all been sized it's all been deprimed it's all been reprimed uh, washed, dried, case sized, primer pockets have been cleaned. So we are ready. Now that the charge is in there, we only have two steps left. And that would just be to seat the bullet um, and to put a crimp on them. So what you can do at this point if you want is you can go ahead and take this thing out of here because you won't be needing it for the rest of the process. You will grab your projectiles. Okay. This is the first time I've ever used these, by the way, so I am truly developing loads here. So I have my 43.5 grains, 43.7, 43.9.
Now, to do the seating depth, this is where you would make use of your digital calipers. You should have earlier, actually, when you were doing your case size, just to make sure that you're at the proper uh, trim length. And if we remember from my notebook here, the trim length that I went with for these was 2.015, which I did verify. I, I didn't record it, but I did check them earlier. So turn this on, zero it out, and you're gonna wanna set this for 2.800 inches, because that is what the load data says is the proper case overall length, all right? So, let's find out where we are here, 2.800. So when you start, I'm not sure if you've ever, like if you've never used digital calipers before, they can be tricky. Once you get used to using them, you'll land on numbers like it's no problem. So, set that aside. It's already been measured out to 2.8, even if it turns off. As long as you locked it down, it's not going anywhere. So now we have our bullet seating die in here. Again, move some stuff. I'm going to bring this, bring the ram all the way up. Spin this in until it touches. Okay back this off and give this just a tiny little turn that's all it really needs and then you're going to tighten it down again doesn't need to be super tight like right there not moving all right i'll leave it out so back this thing off a little bit if you don't know where it was last time and then just verify that this is actually going to make contact yes it will so we're going to start with our first round, all right, put this in the press, you're going to take your first projectile and set that in the top, just like that. Now what this is going to do is this is going to straighten out the bullet as it goes up in, and it's going to push it into the cartridge to a certain seating depth, which is why I want to keep this backed off, because once it's in there, it's a pain in the ass to get it back out. So again, we raise the ram, it'll go up. Go all the way down with your with your handle, and then you're going to check your round. Because right there, you're probably thinking, oh yeah, that looks fine. It's not. It's way too long. I can tell just by looking at it. Yep, the whole green tip is way too long. So, go back to this. Turn it in like a half turn. Try again. A little bit farther that time. All right. Let's see if that fits. Nope, still shy, but it went like halfway down. So let's try one more half turn. It's just getting it set right there that's perfect I can feel it like it just barely goes underneath that caliper but that's that's good right there so I'm gonna leave that the way it is I'm gonna put this back with my 43.5 pile and then this is already locked in so that's not gonna go anywhere so you just leave this knob the way it is and uh, start seating your bullets all right, so I put this one in there like that. You'll notice it's crooked as hell. When it goes up in there, it'll straighten it out. All right, just like that. Take this one, same thing. Put your projectile in. And go ahead and finish this process for the rest of your cases, okay? So at this point, we've seated all of our projectiles, and the last step in our process is going to be to crimp the bullets, which is going to... Put a little bit of a pinch on there just to make sure that those bullets don't get jostled around or back out or anything. So go ahead and move your bullet seating die, put that back in the case, and you're going to grab your uh, crimp die, all right, and drop that into your press. And then I can take this, and it doesn't want to go back on. There you go. So again with this one. We're doing the same thing, bringing the ram all the way up, bringing this down until it touches, 
stack the ram out and I would give this a quarter turn and then start your full first bullet and I'll show you exactly what you're looking for when you do this so as you can see that's gonna come up in here and you're gonna see those jaws close and pinch on it I can tell you already that was way too light I don't see any crimp marks nothing so again turn it in a quarter turn send that up in there again that one actually had some resistance to it now check your bullet you'll see there's a, a faint line around there and you can kind of see four little marks from where the teeth kind of clamp down onto the casing if you can see those clamp marks where those teeth were and you can see that ring that is more than tight enough to crimp down a bullet you don't really need anything more aggressive than that because you'll start deforming the bullet and squishing it so again no crimp on there we bring it up into this put a little crimp on it and check it so i can see my crimp mark and i can see my four little notches from the the jaws squeezing down on it so that's pretty much all there is to loading this stuff now when you're done making this ammo it's usually a good idea to get like a ziploc bag and write on there 43.5 write the bullet the primer everything that went into that bullet and then you can when you go to the range then you can test this ammo out the way that i test ammo and I mean, everybody can do whatever the hell they want is i will take one from this pile shoot it um wait about two or three minutes until your barrel cools down then shoot this one wait another two or three minutes then shoot this one so you're going through all of them at the same time if you do all of these then all of these then all of these but when you start this, you have a cold barrel. By the time you finish, you have a barrel that's probably a little bit hotter. So it's going to give you very inconsistent data. So it's usually a good idea to do one from each sample, okay, and put enough time in between them where the barrel can cool down significantly. Um, what I actually do is I will go to the range and I will take crap 308 ammunition and shoot one, wait five minutes, shoot one, wait five minutes, just to get the barrel at an average temperature where it's going to sit, and then I'll go through and run my tests. But that's pretty much all there is to reloading. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed in this video, or if there's something that I missed, um, or maybe I did not clarify enough, um, feel free to leave a comment, and I will, um, if I can't answer your question, I can probably at least direct you in the, uh, the right place where you could get that answer. But thanks for watching, and hopefully this video would, is going to help you get started on reloading ammunition and help you make that decision on whether or not you want to do it or if you prefer to just shoot factory ammunition.